There she is. Hi, I am so sorry. I'm having computer issues. I'm gonna try and open my talk. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work. I'm so sorry about that. My computer is, it's Murphy's Law. When you need it, it doesn't work. Um, no Deep breaths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everything's up. Okay. Is there still any time left in the hour? Uh, uh, yes, we're good. Uh, if you just want to, I mean, I have like a little intro thing, but in the sake, for the sake of time, you can just, we can just get going. We can get started. Uh, Joe, we want to hear your intro. Come on. Uh, I waited all this time for the intro. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, if, if, uh, if, if, if I must. Okay. Uh, right. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Miranda Holmes Serfan at our MERSEC seminar, as our MERSEC seminar speaker today. Uh, Miranda is coming to us from EPFL in Switzerland, uh, where she's doing her sabbatical, but is normally at NYU, where she's a professor at the Courant Institute and also completed a PhD. Uh, her work focuses on applying mathematical techniques to address problems and questions in soft matter, and also more broadly, just science. Uh, she has strong interest in sticky particle assembly, and I guess uh, we'll use those understandings she has developed to explain how one can assemble structures and proteins effi uh, efficiently despite the great complexities involved. So here is uh, Miranda Holmes Serfan. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. <laughs> no, you got it perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share this. Uh, whoop, nope. Um, I'm not, I'm not a very good uh, poster for mathematicians, but I usually can use my computer. Um, let's try. One. Okay, I think you should be able to see my slides now. Uh, please let me know if you can't. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Um, uh, please interrupt at any moment if you have questions. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, it's always very strange talking to a computer and it's also past my bedtime here in Europe. And so if my eyes are kind of droopy, that's a good time to ask a question. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the kinetics of colloidal self-assembly. I'm told that this is a uh, bio-inspired materials seminar. So let me start by telling you about the connection to biology. Um, so I need a mouse, oh, there we go. So um, here I'm uh, showing you a picture or rather a cartoon of this beast that has put the world in such disarray. Um, this is the SAR, a picture of the sars covid 2 uh, virus. And one of the proteins that's important for assembling and this virus and for its functioning is called this envelope protein. And it's this tiny little guy shown here. Um, and the envelope protein is uh, a sequence of, of 76 amino acids. So you can think of it as like the one amino chain of amino acids. Um, it kind of folds up, it jiggles around, it folds up into this more complicated um, shape that it needs for its functionality. And the remarkable thing about um, how it folds is that it does so really quickly. So if we just try and make a naive, a, a very back of the envelope estimate of how long it should take to fold, well, if there's 76 amino acids, and let's say that there's, then there's 75 angles, and let's say there's roughly three configurations per angle. So if you go three to the power of 75, you get about 10 to the 35 configurations for this um, polypeptide chain. If you are able to sample about 10 to the 12 configurations per second, which is optimistic, but it doesn't really matter what you choose here as long as it's slower than the speed of light, um, then this means this chain needs about 10 to the 15 years to sample all of its configuration space and sort of find its global minimum. Um, but the so-called paradox that's attributed to Leventhal is that proteins fold much, much faster than this. 10 to the 15 years, I think, is longer than the lifetime of the universe, but proteins fold um, in seconds, but usually a lot less. 
Um, and so the, the dogma in uh, protein folding uh, literature is that is that proteins have evolved so that their native state, their ground state, is a low energy uh, state, so it's thermodynamically stable, but it's also kinetically accessible. And the dogma is that proteins have a kind of a funneled landscape where most of the pathways all lead you down to the bottom of the funnel. There might be little bumps along the way, but none of them are so big that you get stuck there for an excessively long time. Okay, so um, I hope I'm not gonna disappoint you, but this is the only thing I'm gonna tell you about COVID, or maybe that's not a disappointment. Maybe it's, it's more of a relief. Um, now I'm gonna move on to materials. And so one of the main challenges of material science is we want to uh, take a bunch of particles, whatever they are, colloids or atoms or molecules, whatever they are, and somehow make them spontaneously form into uh, the material that we want. So maybe it's a crystal, maybe it's like a, um, uh, an isolated structure, whatever it is we want. And we want that structure to form, um, similarly to proteins, we want it to be thermodynamically stable, but we also need it to be kinetically accessible. Okay, and so the question that I want to um, address in this talk or that motivates this talk is how can we uh, design uh, the native structure, the target structure that we want to be both thermodynamically stable and kinetically accessible. Okay, so the system that I'll think about in this talk is colloids. And um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna say very much about colloids, except that I'm gonna think about colloids that are about, um, about a micrometer in diameter. They can be smaller. Um, many of you probably know colloids can form the building blocks for a lot of materials around us. And there's a great interest in using them to design um, new materials. Okay, so how can we design new materials out of colloids? Well, we can change some of their parameters. Um, one parameter uh, that it's quite remarkable that we have control over is shape. And by controlling shape, you can get colloids to assemble into lots of beautiful crystals or structures. Um, shape is hard to think about uh, from a mathematical viewpoint. Um, so I'm gonna focus in this talk on interactions between colloids. And in particular, I'm gonna sort of have in the back of my mind DNA coded colloids. So just very briefly, um, DNA coded, what are DNA coded colloids? Well, if you have particles, which are these A, B, and C particles that I've labeled, um, uh, if we, we can uh, glue strands of DNA onto the surface of these particles, and if there's a short uh, sticky, a short single-stranded sticky end at the end of the DNA strands, then when that short single-stranded end meets its complementary partner, say on another particle, um, those two DNA strands will hybridize, and if there's a lot of DNA strands, then overall the particles will tend to stick together. So the DNA is kind of, I think of as like uh, sort of, I think of these particles as maybe like tennis balls and then the DNA is like a Velcro on top of the tennis ball so that when they get close together, um, the particles tend to stick. So the DNA creates an effective um, free energy um, of interaction between the particles. Now you can get fancy with the DNA and put different DNA strands on different particles um, and by doing so, program different types of interactions between particles. So in the example that I'm showing here, an A-type particle would stick to a B-type particle, and an A-type particle would stick to a C-type particle, but B and C do not tend to stick to each other. Okay, and an important thing for my talk is that if, uh, if the particles are fairly big, so let's say a micrometer, um, the DNA strands are much, much shorter than the particles. And uh, what I've drawn here is definitely not to scale. Um, if if uh, the particles are about a micrometer, then the, the effective width of the interaction between the particles might be, um, say, 10 nanometers or so. So it can be really, really narrow compared to the particles. OK, and so I'm showing here on the right some uh, pictures of um, uh, the many different types of crystals you can form by programming. Um, colloids in this way. Okay, so let's, so in this talk, I'll think about changing interactions between particles. So we want to make some state um, a low energy state. How can we do that? Well, one idea for doing that is to make 
all of the particles different and then look at which bonds are present in the native state and then choose those particles to interact with strong bonds and choose all the other particles, all the other pairs to not interact. Okay, so this works and it works in, in theory and it works in simulations for um, systems that are not um, incredibly large. Um, and it's also, it's a principle, this principle um, of sort of maximizing the number of favorable contacts is also being used to explain um, other kinds of observations of DNA coded collides. The, the trouble with this is that, um, first of all, it's hard experimentally to make so many different uh, particle types. I guess I'm not the one to say that. I guess many of you um, are familiar with the difficulty, but, but even like this uh, sort of image of Big Ben um, up here is made of 60 different kinds of particles. And I've never seen an experiment of DNA coded collides with 60 different kinds of particles that all have, you know, you know, a 60 by 60 interaction matrix. So that's one problem is we don't necessarily have access to this many particle types. Um, another problem is that DNA coded collides diffuse slowly. So even if we know that if we wait a very, very long time, Big Ben will form, that doesn't necessarily tell us that it will form on the timescales that we are interested in. Um, partly because if we have lots of different particle types, it takes a long time for the right ones to find each other. Um, also partly an issue with DNA is that it causes, it slows down particles. Um, so it, in, in, a, in a earlier study um, with, with a former postdoc, we, asked, we modeled this and estimated that it should slow down particles by maybe about a hundred times um, should slow down their diffusion coefficient by a factor of roughly 100. Um, and now in uh, some ongoing experiments with Dave Pines lab, we've estimated, um, we've sort of measured that the slowdown can be anywhere from 10 to 50, maybe 100, but it still, it slows down quite a lot um, from just hydrodynamic friction. And okay, so so we also, so, so what we'd like to do is also somehow understand the rate at which these structures form and not just their energies. Okay, so now rate and energy are sometimes in competition with each other, actually often in competition. So just to give you um, an example to show why they should be in competition, um, let's think about a chain of seven disks on a plane, so seven two-dimensional particles that are interacting with fairly short-range pairwise interactions. Um, so this chain can fold up into uh, four different um, local minima, and I'm showing them here. Three of them have 11 bonds, um, and then one of them has 12 bonds. So I'll call this guy the flower state. And um, if you somehow, for some reason, want to make the flower state, then it's fairly clear what you should do if you want to make it low energy you should increase the strength of the interactions between the particles. And you can do this with identical particles and you just crank up the strength of the interaction and that will make this guy much more likely to um, in equilibrium than the others. But the trouble is as you crank up the strength of the interaction, you, really, you also dramatically slow down the rate at which this forms. Um, and uh, the reason why is that with very strong particles, you essentially just sort of fall downhill and you form bonds and they, they don't break and, um, except for very, over a very long time scale. Um, so, and you don't usually form this one first. Usually you fall into one of these uh, traps first. And then if the bonds are strong, it takes a very long time to hop over this barrier and form um, the flower that you want to. So, so there's, there should be a trade-off between how thermodynamically stable this flower is and the rate at which it forms. Okay, so, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of our um, work on understanding the kinetics of colloidal self-assembly. Um, I'm not going to solve the problem or the inverse problem of protein folding today. Um, but I will tell you some of the things we've learned about the kinetics and some um, ideas for handling this issue between uh, the thermodynamic stability and the kinetic accessibility. Um, so first I will, since we only have half an hour, I may sort of 
skip the first part, but the first part I wanted to tell you about how um, colloids transition between uh, local minima. And this is uh, mostly work with graduate student Rebecca Perry, a former graduate student um, who was an experimental student in Nathan Manaharan's lab. Um, and then I want to tell you uh, about our work on understanding the trade-off between thermodynamic stability and kinetic accessibility of clusters if you program their interactions, if you can control their interactions. And this is mostly work with Anthony Trubiano, a current graduate student, um, but it also uh, builds on work with um, a number of other people. And then um, finally, I want to tell you about some very recent work on controlling these kinetics by using time varying interactions. And that's with Anthony and with my colleague, Eric Van den Eyden. Okay, so um, let me abbreviate this story of transition rates, um, but I will tell you something about it because it helps to set up some of the ideas that we'll use later. So here's a movie of uh, clusters of uh, colloids. Um, they're about a micrometer in diameter and they're, in, they're sitting on a plane, or actually the plane is above them, and they're stuck to the plane with a depletion interaction and they're also interacting with each other by um, a depletion interaction. They're not really colored, um, but Rebecca Perry colored them after to show that we can track their positions. You see these particles jiggle around. So they jiggle around because of the thermal motion in the fluid. And then um, they usually spend time in these three states here, which are the local minima, have the most bonds, but every so often they break apart and then they reform um, uh, one, of, one, of these, one of these structures. So from this movie, we can extract a lot of information. Um, we can extract thermodynamic information. So we can count how long they spend in these states with nine bonds. And we can also count how long they spend in states with eight bonds and states with seven bonds. Um, and they don't usually spend state time in states other with, with fewer bonds for this um, system. And then using a fairly standard statistical mechanical model, we can calculate the expected equilibrium probabilities for all of these different um, states. And we represent these states as graphs, uh, which, which represents which particle is talking to, is, is touching which other particle. Okay, and our, our model accounts for the energy of the interaction, also the entropy, um, which is partly vibrational motions and partly um, uh, rotational entropies, symmetries, um, and also in the case of these uh, floppy graphs, their internal floppy mo motions. Okay, and these agree very well. So that's the thermodynamics, um, which we have a handle on. We can also look at transition rates between these different clusters. So this movie, if you watch one of the boxes, it shows the transition from the cluster on the left to the cluster on the top. And these are just, this is one example of each kind of transition and we counted up the total number of each kind and this is the numbers that we saw. So our goal is to understand these numbers from a theoretical model. Um, okay, so how do we calculate transition rates theoretically? Uh, the kind of standard theory for calculating transition rates is called Arrhenius theory. And roughly this says that the transition rate, if I have a local minima, here, and this axis represents you know, some reaction coordinate. This vertical is free energy. Here I have a local minima. Here I have another local minima, and I have an energy barrier between them. Then the transition rate should go as the exponential of the energy barrier divided by KBT, where T is temperature and KB is um, Boltzmann's constant. Okay, you can calculate some prefactors too, and I'll argue in a moment that that, that doesn't really help. Um, Okay, but the trouble with this is if I look at transitions between these clusters of colloids, which have a very short range interaction, either depletion or either D or DNA, short range attractive interaction, it gives me the same transition rate for every possible transition, um, which, is, which is not what we see in our data. We see different transition rates for different kinds of transitions. So what's going on? The issue is that the landscape, a schematic for the landscape is not this. A better schematic for the energy landscape is something like this, um, where the local minima are really in really narrow, really deep basins. And then the region in between the local minima is almost flat um, in comparison. And the reason that the energy landscape looks like this is that the pairwise interactions between the particles 
are very, very narrow. So they look something like this solid what curve is the here. the horizontal axis? Uh, yeah, what's the horizontal axis? Yeah, good question. So uh, it's kind of a schematic. So maybe like some parameter parameterizing the transition. So in, in I guess- Can you do better than that? I, I will, in just a moment, I will. Okay. Uh, but I'm just sort of trying to make an analogy to Arrhenius theory, where you you kind of you you look for a low lying saddle point and then you sort yeah, but of. It, but I'm always I'm I'm always like uh, confused about what that horizontal axis in even in your left hand plot, you know. Okay, I'm, even in my left. So I guess, I guess usually people define a reaction coordinate, which is something that measures the progress of the reaction. So it might yeah. be, and you define it so it's like one value at one end and then. So what is it in the case of these colloids with the very narrow, you know, thing? What what is it in this? You know, yeah. how, do you, how do you reduce I, something I, like that to I, one dimension? It just seems challenging to reduce. Yeah. It. So actually, here we can map it to exactly one dimension, okay. which you cannot actually in most systems, but here we can, and I will show you that in just okay. in two slides actually. Thank if you. I if I can put that question on hold. Yeah, but it's a good it's a good question. Um, being very schematic here. Um, okay, so the, re the reason that the energy landscape looks more like this is that the pairwise interaction between the particles is very narrow. Uh, so if their diameter is roughly one, then the width might be sort of, you know, um, might be 5%, I think for the experiments I showed you, it would be less for DNA coated colloids. Okay, and that makes the landscape much flatter in some parts and much steeper in, in other parts. Um, uh, my collaborator, Vinithan Menaharan, likes to call this a uh, golf course landscape where you have these very, very, you have these deep, narrow holes, um, but the rest of the landscape is relatively flat in comparison. And with this idea of a golf course in mind, we can start to understand why um, Arrhenius theory is not so effective here. Because even if I use the correction factors in Arrhenius theory, which, which require looking at um, the saddle point and looking at its curvature, that doesn't really give us the information we want. What we, if you, if you, if all you know about a golf course is where the saddle points are and what their curvature is, it's not going to help you sort of find hit your ball into the hole. What we need here is we really need to know something about this whole geometry of the transition region. Um, in this case, its length um, is also the important variable. Um, Okay, and this little picture is to remind me to tell you that sometimes the local minima can be floppy, so the they're not just nice narrow basins. They're also these very complicated, sometimes spidery, uh, flat regions in the energy landscape. Okay, so um, so we have a scale separation between the size of the particles and then the size of the region where they interact, uh, which makes it um, hard to apply Arrhenius theory. Um, it also is very hard to simulate. You have to take very, very small time steps in your simulation. Um, but as a mathematician, it makes us happy to see a scale separation because we can exploit that to get simpler equations. So what we do to study the kinetics here is we start by looking at the Fokker-Planck equation, which describes how the probability density P um, evolves and P describes the density to find the system with configuration X, which is a list of all the particle coordinates at time T. Okay, so, so the probability evolves um, because of the forces on the system, which come from the pair potentials. Here U is the pair potential. Um, and then there's also diffusion. So I'll have a diffusion coefficient D, which will come up again later. Um, and then to study this equation, we look at the limit as the range of the interaction goes to zero, and also the depth of the pair interaction goes to infinity. So these particles are getting like, they're basically sort of only interacting when they exactly touch, uh, but then the energy is energy for that interaction is infinite. And it's possible to make, make sense of this, even though it sounds a little, a little weird. Um, okay, so here's what we get. So this hopefully will answer um, your question. Um, so what we get is sort of a hierarchy of equations, but the most important ones are the ones that lie on the low um, energy states. So the, the ones that are important for describing transition rates are the following. Um, so, so if we start with a cluster, um, like let's say this one here, and we look at how it transitions to this triangle over here, 
Well, it turns out the most likely way it transitions is by breaking a single contact. In this case, it's going to be this contact between the two middle guys. And then those guys open up and then the two sort of middle but side ones come closer together. And then here, they, the two side ones touch and we have a new cluster. Okay, and so that's like, we can actually sort of get this through um, applying perturbation methods to the, to the Farquhar Planck equation. That this is the most likely way for the transition to happen. It's also fairly intuitive that that's how it should happen. So now I can parameterize this using one variable. And that variable is going to be the arc length distance that the configuration traverses through its full configuration space. So it lives in two n-dimensional configuration space. And I'm going to represent that as just a single curve. One way to parameterize it would be the bond distance between these two particles. Um, I prefer to use an arc length parameterization, which uh, but it doesn't really matter. Anyways, this guy is, so the parameterized variable is called x, let's call it x, and I'll say this guy is zero, and then this guy is at the distance l, the distance that this, this um, cluster has moved in configuration space. Right. This is uh, arc length taken over the most probable trajectory? So it's, it's arc length um, with the rotations and the translations removed. So to go from x to uh, y, you look at the shortest possible path you can get there, um, where shortest is over all possible rotations and translations at every point. Okay. So it's yeah. not specific to this optimal trajectory you solved for from the Fokker Planck? Um, so every, every possible trajectory, so this is, so it, this arises as the most likely trajectory. So as okay. when we're looking for transition rates, this, this comes up as- I get it, yeah. 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 And, and then what the Fokker Planck equation tells us in the limit is that, okay, the dynamics of this system are the following. So we have just diffusion here, DTP is D times DXXP, that's just a diffusion equation here. Um, but the interesting thing is the boundary conditions for this diffusion equation. So here they're kappa times P double prime equals P prime. Kappa is a parameter, I'll, I'll say something about it in a minute. So what's unusual about this boundary condition is that usually if you have a diffusion equation, you have either an absorbing condition, which is P is zero, stuff gets absorbed, or reflecting, which in this case would be P prime is, is zero. So you just sort of reflect off. And this is neither. This is P prime is something involving second derivatives of P, um, which was really surprising the first time we saw this. Um, it turns out that these are called sticky boundary conditions and uh, probabilists have studied this. And if you see these, what they mean is that your process is diffusing, but then when it hits zero or L, it actually sticks there and it can stick there for finite time. So the probability that you are interested in actually has delta functions in it. Um, it has a delta function at zero and a delta function at L, um, uh, which, is, which is also what we want because we want the process to spend time in these low energy states. Um, Okay, and now the important thing, the thing that will be important for sort of the rest of and the second why part. Are of the those the boundary conditions? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna sort of maybe not be very satisfying here, not really answer that question, but it, it comes from uh, just because it would, it would um, maybe take me a little bit beyond this, but it comes from balancing the flux into the boundary with the change in probability at the boundary. So this is the flux into the boundary, and then this on the left is the change in the probability at the boundary, if my probability has a delta function there. Okay, I understand. I think okay. I understand. Yeah. Okay, and then the weight of the delta function is kappa. Yep, yeah. yeah. all right, I think I understand, thank you. Okay, so one of, so the, the kind of the, the, the usefulness of this approx of this doing this asymptotics and getting this equation. Well, there's a couple of couple reasons this is useful. One is we no longer have a potential. There's no pair potential here. The pair potential collapsed into this parameter kappa, which um, I like to call the sticky parameter because it measures how sticky the particles are. So if it's bigger, they like to spend more time stuck to each other. Um, kappa, if you want to estimate it from an actual pair potential, it's the integral of um, the Boltzmann factor e to the minus u over kBt um, over the region where the particles are actually um, 
interacting with each other, so over the attractive well. Um, and I gather that that's also, this parameter is also called the avidity in some, some areas of science. So the potential, we no longer have sort of very stiff forces in the system. These stiff forces are translated into a boundary condition, which is represented by just one parameter kappa. Um, okay, and that parameter, will, we use this parameter a lot. Okay, so now, um, yeah, that's important. So, so now we want to use this to get transition rates. Um, so what we do is we apply a theory called transition path theory, which um, gives an exact way to calculate transition rates. It's infeasible to apply it in high dimensional space, but on one dimensional paths, it's very easy. And then we get a formula for the transition rates, um, which depends on the sticky parameter. One over, so it depends on one over kappa, diffusion coefficient, um, the length of the path and the particle diameter. And when I say length, it's not really the length. There are uh, sort of extra entropic things to consider, but I, I don't want to worry about those right now. Um, okay, so um, we want to estimate what these transition rates are. Uh, we know all of these parameters except for kappa. Um, so, so D we know, diameter we know, L is computed for each path. Um, Diffusivity, we're going to start by using diffusivity for a single particle in free space, and then kappa we need to measure. Um, if we try to estimate it from what we know about the potential, uh, sort of using all that we know about the electrostatics in the system and the depletion interaction, so on, we get an estimate of 2 to 200. Um, so that's not very useful. Um, what we can do instead is we can go back to our equilibrium measurements and um, notice that the partition function for the nine bonded states, the states with nine bonds, um, so these local minima, uh, you can show equals kappa to the power of nine, because there's nine bonds, times some kind of volume of these nine bonded states. And I'm showing in this picture, I'm showing circles whose area equals this volume, this kind of the entropic factor that we need to worry about. Same thing for the eight bonded states and seven bonded states. So we have kappa to the eight and kappa to the seven. So now if we go back to our measurements, we look at how much time we spend in each of these states with nine bonds, with eight bonds, with seven bonds, et cetera. And um, so if we just take the ratio of those times, that's the ratio of partition functions. And the ratio of partition functions is our unknown parameter times the ratio of volumes, which we can calculate um, using our previous calculations for equilibrium statistical mechanics. So we can solve for kappa, and that gives us uh, you know, some estimate here. It's 29. Um, and we can actually repeat this estimate using different kinds of clusters and different uh, numbers of bonds. And we always get something roughly in this range. Um, so this is a, sort of a much more robust measurement of the sticky parameter or the avidity um, than we would get if we actually tried to measure the potential, um, because it's very sensitive to, to the actual potential. Um, okay, so then we use this in our theory and in the interest of time, so I'm not gonna draw this story, but we uh, tried using, plugging in all these numbers, um, using the diffusion coefficient for a single particle in free space, it doesn't work. Um, the numbers are too big. And that's because um, the particles are not in free space, they're next to a plane. So now we try near a plane and you see it still doesn't work. These are all the counts we get, and these are the measured counts. And so these are still too big. And um, any, does anyone wanna guess what's going wrong here? Why is this still too big? Um, are these numbers still too big? Uh, one guess would be your particles are near other particles. Yeah, so yeah, sure. Sure, so the particles are also, yeah, they're also diffusing near each other. Yeah, great. Um, and so we, uh, it's very hard to predict those diffusion coefficients theoretically, but we can measure them because we have all these transition paths so we can measure the diffusion coefficients, um, plug all these numbers in, and then we get these numbers here, um, which are much closer to the ones that we measured. Um, 
Okay, so we sort of view that as a success of this theory. Um, and uh, um, I guess the, the moral of that story is that colleague kinetics are different from kinetics of atoms or, or particles with smoother interactions, um, but we can handle them using these sticky equations. Um, in particular, I think the most important thing that makes them different is that entropy becomes very important. So the size of the space that you're diffusing around in and the geometry of that space. And actually this geometry can be much more complicated than the one I've um, described. And this, this I, sort of idea um, uh, was used in, in other ways and one, one uh, description I really like is of transition paths as a kind of bicycle hub with very complicated spokes leading out from um, a center that describes transitions in a certain kind of uh, crystal. Okay, and these sticky Fokker-Planck equations, I've showed you one uh, thing they're useful for calculating transition rates, um, uh, but they're also I, I didn't show this, um, but, but one thing we're working on is using these to actually get uh, much faster ways to solve, um, to simulate um, these kinds of systems. Okay, so that is the first part of my talk um, and uh, about sort of transition rates. And now I want to transition to um, telling you something about this story about the thermodynamic stability and the kinetic accessibility of clusters. Um, before I start, are there any questions um, so far? Okay, so let me um, move on. We're, we're still gonna think about clusters, but we're gonna think about a slightly different system. We're gonna think about polymers of let's say colloids that start off in a- uh, Sorry, we, we do have a oh. question actually. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah. In the chat. Um, what might kappa depend on in a different system of colloids? Um, yeah, oh yeah, good question. So kappa is actually, it's so it's the integral of e to the minus u over the attractive well. So roughly that's e to the minus the depth of the well and then times the width of the well. So kappa is large if the depth is large. So if you have a deep well, um, but it's small if the width is small. So if you, so you have a very narrow potential, then kappa becomes small as well. So if you wanna make things sticky, you have to make the interaction wider or deeper. Um, so, so for um, like DNA coded colloids, uh, there's theories to try and calculate the pair potential. Um, and so if you, know, if you have the pair potential, you can go ahead and evaluate the sticky parameter using the formula. Um, if you don't have the pair potential, though, you can, you know, measure it using experiments with clusters, as, I, as I've described. Yeah, but roughly it's, you know, if, if you have a pair potential, it's the, it's the depth and the width of the pair potential. Those are the important things. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we have um, polymers of colloids still in two dimensions, and, but that's not all that important. It's just for the example. And they jiggle around, the backbone is fixed, but the particles can interact. And we want them to fold into a given cluster. Um, but now I'm gonna let the interactions between the colloids vary, okay? So they're not all gonna be the same. Okay, so as an example, let's think about six disks um, like this, and they can fold into one of three states as we saw before. Um, if the interactions are all the same, so the sticky parameters are all the same, then um, the triangle forms with 11% probability. So as a challenge, we're gonna try and make the triangle form with close to 100% probability. And the way we do that is we'll um, assign the particles labels, let's say A, B, A, B, A, B, like in this picture. Um, and then each type of, each pair of particles has a different sticky parameter. So K, A, A, kappa A, A is the sticky parameter for the A, A's and so on. Okay, and we want the triangle to form with high probability. We also want it to be kinetically accessible on experimental time scales. Okay, so as a first step, we can think about, well, if the particles are all different, what would we do? And in that case, we would make, we would look at the bonds in the native state and make them all strong. So here I'm gonna set them equal to, I'm gonna report, uh, sometimes I'll report the depth of the potential instead of the sticky parameter, but you can convert between them. Okay, so 12 kBT is pretty strong. Um, 
And then for other pairs, um, I'll let the depth be about 0 0.1 kBT. So we're not going to set it exactly equal to zero, um, partly because computationally that's harder and partly because um, experimentally I gather that even if you don't design DNA to stick, it's still, there's still some very weak interaction. So we'll just let it you know, be not quite zero. Okay, so blue shows you the probabilities you get in equilibrium with identical interactions and orange shows you with all particles different. So you can do really well with, with if they're all different. Um, okay, but now let's try and do it with just two. So here uh, I'm gonna have them in uh, arranged as A, B, A, B, A, B. And if I follow the same strategy that we did before, we look at the bonds in the native state and we make them strong, that means that the BB bond should be strong and the BA bond should be strong and the AA bond should be weak. Um, and if we try that and we calculate the equilibrium probabilities, we don't do very well. We get this, which is about 20%, but it's not very high. It's not nearly a hundred. Okay. So going into a little more detail to see what goes wrong, well, here are the two um, clusters that had high probability in the previous calculation. And so I'm just gonna count the number of bonds in each of these clusters. So in the, the one we want, we have three BB interactions, one AB interaction and no AA interactions. And in these guys, in both of these guys, we have two BB interactions and two AB interactions. So if I want this guy to be high probability, then I should make B be really strong. But then I also want this to be stable. So I need to have some AB. So let's make that kind of medium. So we'll make it seven KBT. Um, and then AA should be weak. And now when I do that, um, this is what I get. I get the purple bar, uh, which is getting pretty close to hundred. And by making these bonds stronger, I can make it, we can make it get arbitrarily close to hundred. Okay, so this is just using two kinds of particles and arguing um, combinatorially. Um, so now we ran simulations, Brownian dynamic simulations to see what happens dynamically and um, with these interactions. And this blue curve shows the probability of the triangle as a function of time. And you see that after about nine hours, this is real time. We've tried to estimate, um, convert Brown, the simulation time to real time for one micrometer collets. Um, and uh, after nine hours, you only have about 50% probability. And if you want to get over 90%, you need to wait about 45 hours. Okay, so this is really long. I find this slow, um, especially given that we've, we've been pretty optimistic with the diffusion coefficient here. And if you have DNA co coded collides, you multiply this by you know 10 or 100, it's really slow. And this is just a system of six. Like usually we would want to build something bigger than that. Okay, so um, what choice of interactions allows this triangle to form quickly? Okay, so that's the next question. How does it scale with the number of particles this time? This oh time? gosh, I don't know how it would scale with the number of particles. But yeah. n to the what power? Um, I, I really don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, so in order to explore the kinetics, um, I need to make up a model uh, that is simpler than just running simulations because the experiments we estimate take time, the simulations also take a really, really long time. Um, so we map our uh, system to a collection of graphs representing just which particle is bonded to which other particle. And then we're gonna model the system as a Markov chain on the set of graphs. And we, so this is just, this is sort of our model. So the details are not all that important. Um, the thing to mention is that the equilibrium probability of each of these graphs, um, we know in terms of the sticky parameters of the graphs. So um, we just multiply all the sticky parameters for all the bonds involved in each graph. And then there's a, there's a volume factor, which, which um, is, uh, you know, somewhat, involved to calculate, but once you've calculated it, you can reuse it for all the different sticky parameters. Um, and then we also have a model for the, the sort of rates of jumping, of forming a bond and the rates of breaking a bond. And so, so you have to calculate the volume for all the different graphs that are in your system? 
Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay, so that yeah, so that's involved. But once you've done it, you're done, and you can change the parameters as much as you want, and um, not redo that calculation. If that you try to go to a bigger system, you're gonna it's gonna get exactly. intractable. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. So this approach does not scale, um, at least not the way we've we've done it. Um, but it does give give us something to investigate um, uh -huh. the trade off for smaller systems. Um, uh, we also have a model for the kinetics. So um, just very briefly, we assume that the rate of forming a bond is set by the mean first passage time to form that bond if you're in equilibrium in a given state, um, which doesn't depend on the sticky parameters. Um, and then the rate of breaking a bond is set by detailed balance. So that does depend on the parameters. Um, Okay, so again, calculating all these forward rates is also um, quite involved, um, but we only need to do it once. Um, okay, so then what we do with this model is we calculate the equilibrium probability of the triangle, and then we also calculate the mean first passage time to form the triangle, which we can do because with the Markov chain, um, we know how to calculate um, mean first passage times essentially by solving a linear system of equations. Okay, and so here, just as an example, I'm showing what's hap what happens if you vary, if all the sticky parameters are the same, um, how this trade-off works. So if kappa is large, you get 11% probability. If kappa is small, but, but the rate is small. And if kappa is small, um, the rate is uh, higher, but the probability is, is smaller. Okay, it gets a little more interesting if we now vary these three parameters for the two kinds of particles. And here what we did was we just sampled in all like many different values of these parameters in, on sort of a grid and then plotted uh, for each of those we worked out the probability and the mean first passage time. And this is what we get. And so there's a few things to notice about this. Um, so one is we can make uh, the triangle form with high probability. And uh, as long as we choose the interactions that, that I described before. Um, but as we saw in the simulations, the mean first passage time to form it becomes very small, goes to zero. Um, we could also form the triangle with high rate. We could form it very quickly um, using, you know, sort of the, the, the AA interaction is very weak still and the AB is pretty weak and BB is still pretty strong, but now the equilibrium probability for this triangle is small, um, smaller. Um, this is actually kind of interesting that, um, just notice that in going from this star to this star, what we do is we change the AB interaction. So we, instead of it, it being weak, we now make it strong. Um, and that's actually interesting because proteins, um, I'm told are usually slightly flexible. And they're also um, marginally stable. They're often marginally stable. They can be taken apart quite easily. So this is a little bit reminiscent of, of what happens for, for many proteins. Um, okay, and then what's interesting is, is this region um, of, of sort of uh, um, probability and mean first passage times is bounded. Um, so there's a boundary to this region. It's this boundary here that I'm trying to trace out with my mouse. Um, and that boundary we think is real. It's not just because we haven't sampled enough kappa values. Um, and that boundary is also um, important if you're interested in self-assembly. And the reason is, so we want to argue that if you want to design a self-assembling system, you should design it to be on this boundary. I can't tell you exactly where on the boundary, but I can tell you that you should be on this boundary. And the reason why is let's pretend you're not on the boundary. Let's pretend you're somewhere in the middle here. Well, if you're in the middle, then you can increase both the equilibrium probability and the mean first passage time. And both of those are good. So why not just choose different parameters to increase both of those? But what's special about the points in the boundary is all of a sudden, you can't. There's if you're on the boundary, there's no other point which increases both the equilibrium probability and the mean first passage time. You can increase the equilibrium probability, but you have to sacrifice some of your kinetics. Okay, so points like this are called Pareto optimal, um, and this this is a terminology that comes from um, 
optimization theory, if you have multiple objectives, which we do. Um, and, and the collection of Pareto optimal points, it makes a Pareto front. Um, I first learned about this idea in economics class sort of way back as an undergraduate, um, but it's actually sort of fairly widely used in, in um, optimization. Okay, so if we're interested in self-assembly, uh, what I want to argue is that you should design your system to be somewhere on this boundary. So that's the thing that we should be interested in. Um, now, I know, I know that I'm running out of time. Um, I, so I'm not gonna, so the next part of the talk is how we calculate this, this boundary. Um, I'm not gonna go through that uh, because I don't wanna keep you too long. We do it using a genetic algorithm. And I do just wanna tell you that we can calculate this boundary using a genetic algorithm. Um, and once we have uh, points on the boundary, we can look at those points and read off how the parameters should vary um, depending on which objective we care about. Um, and so, for example, for this one, for the triangle, if we care more about kinetics, we have small AA interaction. And as we scale up the A, sorry, AB interaction, we um, sacrifice kinetics and we move more towards uh, thermodynamic stability. Okay, so we've calculated these for, for different systems. Um, for the triangle, here's the Pareto front. Um, it's actually quite shallow, which means you have to make quite a trade-off between these two objectives. Uh, for other clusters, the Pareto front is steeper. And that's good because that means I don't have to sacrifice so much equilibrium probability in order to form quickly. Um, and so we can ask, well, how could I make something that's really steep? And this is maybe the last thing that I want to tell you. I'm sorry that I'm going a little bit over time, um, which is if we now allow for three types of particles, we get a Pareto front, which is basically vertical for the triangle. So it's probably it's ever so slightly sloped, but you can't you can't really tell. Um, and that means that there's basically no trade off between um, equilibrium probability and mean first passage time. Okay, and we tried with four types and we, I had to shift, we had to shift it a little bit to the right uh, so that you could actually see the line, but it's really right on top of the green. So you can't do any better with four. Um, okay, we also, you know, for, for the parallelogram, we also get a vertical Pareto front. Um, okay, very last example is if we want to make an octahedron out of spheres, we get a Pareto front, which is a single point which is great. And we have to use three types of particles to do that, but that means there's no trade-off here. So, um, so obviously this, so our technique doesn't scale to, to very much larger systems. So that's a work in progress is figuring out how we can um, still compute this trade-off and try and optimize it and make it steeper for larger systems. Um, but I do sort of hope you can believe me that if you want to design a self-assembling system, um, one useful thing to think about is this Pareto front and think about where you want to be on that and how to, how to make it steeper. Um, okay. Uh, I think, so I'll say one more minute, which is if you want to make up, actually, uh, never mind. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Um, and uh, so these are my conclusions. So, so we started by thinking about a funnel. Now we're thinking about Pareto fronts, but at least this gives us sort of a concrete tool um, that we can use to, um, to try to uh, You're frozen or maybe I don't have internet. You're not frozen, Joe. She's frozen. Oh, okay. I'm frozen. Oh, okay. well, you're oh there, back. you're back. Yes. Okay. We lost you for. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we we lost. Yeah, but uh, if you could re-say the that last twenty seconds or so. Okay. Sorry. So I'm not sure when I cut out. Um. Uh. I guess so. In conclusion, so I guess things I hope you can kind of take away from this are a if you want to describe colloidal kinetics. Um, sticky equations can be helpful and can lead to different ways of thinking about the system. 
Um, and then B, if you want to create a funneled energy landscape like a protein, um, one way to think about doing that is to calculate the Pareto front that describes this trade-off between kinetics and thermodynamics, um, and then think about how to make it steep, because that's, that's the goal. Um, and then I did not mention our work on time varying interactions, but the one thing I want to ask there is, so if you can vary the interactions in time, then we can, as mathematicians, can set up an optimization problem to figure out the best time varying interactions mm -hmm. um, to sort of achieve a certain goal at a certain time, certain probability at a certain time. Um, but we need experimental constraints to do this. Um, so, you know, these are our protocols, which are some wiggly lines for energies. And I don't know if this is experimentally feasible. I doubt it. Um, so I'm interested in what might be experimentally feasible because then we can use that in our optimization. Um, so thank you for your attention. Thanks to my collaborators and to the funding sources. Great. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the speaker? Uh, yeah, I have a, can just, so let's say you're making that triangle with like, uh, yeah whatever it was, seven particles? Yeah. So, yeah. so then aren't there like a whole series of first passage? I mean, it's first monomer to dimer, you know, one fits two. Oh, sorry, yeah. You're, so, just, so I mean, you're just doing between like one configuration and another configuration, but. Yeah, no, when I say mean first passage time, I mean, how long does it take to form the triangle? From what though? Starting from the chain. So. Yeah. Okay. So then, and then, um, okay. And so then the, um, and so yeah, then so there's the, a whole sequence of steps in between. Yeah. But we model that sequence of steps as a Markov chain. Yeah. So once we know the rates for the Markov yeah. chain, all those volumes the, and yeah, the total mean first passage time to, to, to go from here to here. But then where does this funneling come in? I mean, you have this first passage. Uh, yeah. Now you've gone through, you know, all the intermediate steps are gone now. Yeah. Right? And so then, uh, so then where's this funneling bit? Yeah, so the funneled bit is the fact that, so the funneled bit is when you don't have a trade-off between your, say your mean first passage time, some measure of kinetics, which we use as mean first passage time and your, um, equilibrium probability, your sort of thermodynamic stability. So I don't know how to really measure the, how, the sort of the shape of an energy landscape, but I do know how to sort of make up functions that measure thermodynamics or kinetic, you know, some rate of folding. So those are the things I'm going to look at. And then usually they act against each other. Um, so usually if you increase one, you decrease the other. But then sometimes we just get lucky um, and they don't act against each other. Um, so, so when we let, when we sort of let the particles change their types, so from A to B, then that gives us, that gives us actually sort of the best possible trade-off. So the best, so the, like the steepest trade-off between these two objectives. What, what did you mean by let them change type? Uh... Um, so, you, you yeah, actually, sorry, I, I, I really kind of skipped through that, but um, let me see if I can go back here. But um, so, so if you think about just A, B, A, B, A, B interactions, so in that order, then there's only so, so much you can do. Um, you're, you know, you're sort of limited in how fast this thing can fold and how stable it is. But if you now, ask, okay, if I look at all possible particle orderings, which we did not do, we did this by sampling, but if you, if you look at all possible particle orderings, what's the best one? Then um, you can end up with a vertical line here. Uh, when you calculate the Pareto front, you, you end up with a vertical line. And, and what that means is that, is that um, so this is probably not perfectly vertical, it's probably, it's, ever so slightly sloped. And what that means is you only have to change 
you decrease your probability from like one to maybe 0.98, say, and all of a sudden your rate goes from almost zero to like pretty big, like 0.5. So, so the steeper this curve, this line is, the steeper this Pareto front is, the better it is for self-assembly. And so, so, um, so we find, you know, if, if we just decide on a fixed ordering ahead of time, we can calculate the Pareto front and that tells us what the trade-off is. But then if we now allow the particles to change, so A can change to B, B can change to A, and we're allowed, we can rearrange these and change their types as much as we want, then sometimes we can do really well and uh, get a vertical line where there's no trade-off. So um, I have a, a question. You mentioned that you're using the mean first passage time as, as kind of one measure of kinetics. And of course, one could think of others. So oftentimes, you're interested it may be in some yield at, at finite time. And I think those could be rather different, because if I have very long-lived competing states, and that could really drive up a mean first passage time, but I still might get an acceptable yield. So have you looked at yeah. that? We haven't looked at that, but that's a good point that um, I could put, you know, different things on these axes um, and still do the same calculation. And we haven't looked at um, uh, what at, at, at sort of how much this changes if you change the objectives that you put there, if you change the functions that you're using to measure um, kinetics, say. We're starting to look at that because these, these functions that we have been using are, are hard to sample. So um, we're looking for functions that are easier to get through to simulation. Um, but, but I can't say anything concrete now. Uh -huh. I can say that if we change our model, so our model involved calculating a bunch of volumes and a bunch of uh, first passage times to go from step to step. If we kind of change those by quite large amounts, we still get qualitatively the same um, curves here. The numbers change ever so slightly, but the, the shape stays the same. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, that's a good point. So I, we're very interested in what, like, what, what, are, what would be a good thing to put on these axes. Um, is there something more meaningful? How much of the information is in the graphs and how much is it in the particular uh, interactions uh, be, you know, the, between the particles? Yeah. Um, I, I tend to think it's mostly the interactions, like which particle is touching which other particle, and then what's the next bond that can form. You know, That's cause, my, yeah. Cause, you know, because like we work with like instead of spheres, yeah, you know, we're working with like these kinds of objects, right? Oh wow, yeah. And so then, so yeah. then these objects have a kind of shape, you know, and yeah. there's a lot of information just in their shape, and so every one of these objects is identical. Okay. But then when they come together, you know, they form an octahedra, okay. you know, so that's your, you know, that's your graph, what you know, eight of them, you yeah. know, but they're, each one's identical, but they, but, be, but because, you know, we encode information in the sides, in the, you know, the dihedral angles and yeah. also in the interactions, you know, so for example, they can't come in uh, with a, you know, they they can only come in in a certain orientation with chirality. Mm -hmm. They can't, they won't interact, you know, the opposite way. And because yeah. it's in a lock and key, they that changes the range and things. And so there's mm -hmm. there's certain information in, uh, and so now we're using just one kind of interaction, mm -hmm. you know, instead of three, you know. But then we can get, uh, you know. Uh, you know, high yield and high assembly. So, yeah. so you know, it's not this magic number of three types or two types or something. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's in, but but because we put a more complexity in the particle itself. Yeah. Uh, then we can have fewer particles. Uh, so where what what would be the formalism to express this that would, uh, you, you know, that would tell us what's the op, you know, so how much of the kind of control is in the shape of that particle or in the interaction? Yeah. How's that? Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great question. So that's something we sort of like to look at is like, why for some things is four, is three types good enough? Why for some structures is two types good enough? Um, why, like when, like how does this number of types depend on the sort of the size of the system? 
Um, yeah, but even the types, I mean, it's good. Yeah. You have a spherically symmetric potential. Well, what yes. What happens if you break that symmetry like what we did? You know, yes. we have, and then yeah. now. And then there's certainly a lot more information in the just a single interaction. Yeah. And so yeah. it's still, so we still have a single interaction, but but because we have uh, the particle shape is different, then you know that changes the entropy and you know and the and the free energy and the partition function, all that. So there's like conf there's like part of it is in the energetics, but then part of it's in the configurational entropy, you know, and then part of it's in the network, and you know, and so how do you tease out which is in which part in, in, if you're going to do this Pareto optimization? You know, I want to optimize now yeah. along this geometry coordinate along this structural coordinate yeah which yeah. i don't even know what that coordinate is i mean you know shape or something you know yeah yeah yeah. so i mean i think the idea is is fairly general so the i mean the idea of how you get this um like Pareto front and how you, how you find it and how you try and optimize it is, is fairly general which is you have whatever parameters describe your system here there's sticky parameters and in your case they could be some shape parameters and then you let those vary and you try and look for the ones that sort of lie on this, on the, on the boundary, on, on, on this Pareto boundary. Um, and, you know, how you do that for a particular system, I think, could, you know, the details would, would, would uh, vary, I think. But the idea, I think, is fairly, fairly general. You have a bunch of parameters you can vary and you look for, like, what are the best parameters that you can choose. Yeah, but this calculation of the kinetics, I mean, if you're going to, you know, have hundred particles or something, you know, how are you going to ever calculate? Yeah. 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 Well, no, that's true. Um, I mean, we, I mean, you know, these are, you know, we made things like this, you know, out of like hundreds of particles, you know, yeah. come together and then, you know, and then form with high yield, you know, so how, how are we going to calculate something like that? Uh, you know, optimal over, uh, you know, it's one thing, six particles. Now we go to 100. You know, what, what happens to the calculations? Yeah. Um, I mean, the net must go. Which is why it's sort of. Large, right? It's factorial. You're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, so, I'm, so I'm not suggesting you should. So what we did was enumerate all the possible states um, to try and figure out, like, what is what, yeah. what is it we can say about the system? Um, so that's not, that, definitely right? not an approach that would scale. If you have um, hundreds of particles. You know. Yeah. In, in principle, you could still do this by simulating for each type of parameter running a long simulation and extracting the information. That's not going to be very efficient. No. So um, that's why we're looking for maybe better things to put on these axes that you can yeah. get more quickly. Um, maybe you can also use a sort of, uh, so I didn't say how we do the optimization, but, but um, uh, we don't use any information about gradients in, in the optimization. So we just sort of calculate things, get a bunch of, you know, and then we, we don't look at how they would vary if you change the parameters. Um, it's possible to incorporate those gradients and, and get sort of more targeted sort of movement towards your, your optimum. Um, and there are methods that do that for uh, more thermodynamic quantities. So it is feasible. And I've seen it done for um, simulations with like 100 particles or more. Um, and uh, you, I mean, you have to have fast simulations and it's going to be pretty expensive, but it's harder than doing, so anything involving kinetics is going to be harder than anything involving thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, so it is a harder problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that's why I'm not saying we've, we've solved it, but at least this is one thing that you can look at if you have a system and you're not sure which parameters to, to choose. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously, so there's lots of work left to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question from uh, the audience. Uh, do you know how the shape uh, slash symmetry of the final structure is related to the shape of the uh, Pareto front? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing at all. It seems like structures that are more symmetric need more types of particles, but you know, we basing that on very low numbers of, you know, small numbers of experiments. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, I mean, we have an algorithm. So we sort of think that this might be a useful optimization to do, but I can't tell you anything. I can't give you any physical intuition for that. Like why? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, if I looked at each, each, each example, right. And I can, we can kind of rationalize each, each example once we see it. Um, like we did for the triangle instead sort of A, A, B and B, B, but um, we can't do that ahead of time. Hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, all, right. all right. If uh, if that's the case, then I'd like to thank our speaker again. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Um, I. I don't know how to end this exactly. So <laughs> uh, let's see a round of applause uh, or a round of reactions. Yes. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> thank you, Miranda. Thanks. Yes, thanks. All right. I guess I just end this. Okay. Yeah. Ciao. Bye. See you. Thanks,